Good morning. Been gone for quite a while, but I got my baby in place. This is uh, my Woodburn Light and Company lathe. And uh, first of all, here in sunny California, it's been cold and I want to introduce you to my friend, Mr. Heater. It's about 42 this morning, a little bit of a breeze. Feels like down into 38 and, and uh, that's cold here. Here in sunny California, I'm in Northern California, but it's still cold, it's cold here. But I got my, my baby placed now this is a pre-Civil War and, and it was before a lot of features were uh, invented. Apparently, I made some feet here because apparently they, they didn't uh, drill holes in the feet to mount them down. And, and since this uh, particular piece right here is so old, I, I'm not drilling any holes in it. I don't want to change anything. This is, uh, this was cast, I want to say, I, I'd like to say, 1848. It, the reason for that is that would make it 100 years old. When I was born, uh, the company was in business from, I think, 45, 46 to, yeah, about 1845 to 1851. And there's a lot of, 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 uh, characteristics of this lathe that it's really strange but uh, they became obsolete around 1851 Thayer and Houghton came out with a, a new modern lathe that uh, obsoleted a lot of uh, issues on this particular lathe first, first of all this is a chain lathe which actually uses a chain looks like a bicycle chain but it isn't because this is uh way before the bicycle would have been invented but it also has uh some other features which are antique obsolete this right here is called a rise and fall because the the cutter if i can get this right here now this is these this is all the stuff that i got with it and uh, this cutter, I don't think, was made uh, pre-Civil War because this is a um, thread cutting cutter. And but it but it was in the pile of stuff that I got with with this lathe, which I was really lucky that it had really a lot of uh, parts that came with it. There's a few pieces missing, but most of them are here. This right here is a rise and fall. You can see, I'm not doing very good, but you can see that the actual slide where the tool is hooked to goes up and down, and that's called a rise and fall, which was uh, invented by uh, a gentleman called James Brown in, I believe it was 1819, uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, which, which this particular lathe was manufactured in Worcester uh, is, and also it, this was uh, manufactured before they had uh, or, or at least before they were instituted onto uh, machinery uh, dovetails like they have the modern lays have dovetails with uh, gib keys and, and things to hold the slide rest to the uh, the bed of the bathe of the of the lathe, excuse me. Now you can see the uh, the diamonds which which the slide rest rides on, and of course the uh, this the tailstock, it the inside, which uh, really harkens back all the way to uh, Henry. Uh, What's his name? That British guy that invented the slide rest? <laughs> you know, and uh, he just uh, took square bar and turned them 
up on their edge and so this one is thinner than a modern lathe which probably is uh you know it, uh, would wear out faster but uh what i wanted to show you was this other archaic feature characteristic of this little buddy little baby and this right here is the weight this <laughs> because i was talking about the, the uh, this is what i believe that it was before they had the uh the dovetails with the gib keys to hold the uh slide rest down and what they did was put a, a hook from the slide rest down to a weight i just put that weight on here i'm just getting this i finally got this all set up here and uh i think this is just so cool uh that i got the weight with it the rise and fall i got the tail stock even the uh, uh follow rest or steady rest here it's not a follow rest and all of this stuff is uh original to the lathe because this uh chain that goes through here the the steady rest as well as the uh tail stock have uh, clearances for the chain on this side so i was really fortunate that that this stuff stayed with the with the lathe and also uh one reason that i'm doing this video right now is this is the change gears and and i uh i've said before i'm i want to dedicate this trailer to this particular lathe because it's such a piece of history and so I, I built this uh, display for the change gears, but they're down here at the tailstock. I put them on there before I had the lathe in here. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut them off because change gears go down here at the uh, headstock. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll uh, cut that piece of tubing off and bring it down here. And uh, it's another thing even you know old lays compared to this would be modern um you lose the change gears now, i know this isn't all of them but i got about 10 change gears here which which was pretty good for it to stick together for the last 175 years <laughs> and and now these are my tail stocks the uh and I and I made I was lucky enough to get five of these, so I made this little support right here. Now this is this is actually where it should go down here at this end with the with the tail stock, all the little bits that go in there. And uh, so in 1851, this is my understanding, is that Thayer and Houghton came out with a technological wonder. And basically what they did was they made the, the chain, the rise and fall, and also the weight. They made them all uh, obsolete. And, and uh, I don't know if that had anything to do with the demise of uh, Woodburn Light and Company. But what happened was in 1851, uh, Woodburn left the company and a gentleman called Wood <laughs> came in and it became Wood Light and Company and they went on to manufacture they they didn't manufacture lathes like this anymore but they manufactured the modern lathes that uh, Thayer and Houghton uh, came up with which uh, which I believe makes this particular lathe a, uh, a, little, a little nexus in history. Now I'm in Northern California and, and the West Coast, California, you know, we're not known for a uh, hotbed of industrial innovation and activity, it's at least back uh, in the first uh, three or four decades of the uh, Industrial Revolution, which actually took place on the East Coast and uh, the Silicon Valley 
of those days would have been Worcester, Massachusetts, where this lathe was manufactured. They had a lot of uh, uh, manufacturers. It, there was it was a hotbed of, of uh, technological innovation, and uh, people were uh, the smartest people were. I, I guess you'd call them uh, mechanical engineers. And these people were putting this stuff together. Of course, you, you have to take that with a grain of salt because uh, in uh, the early 1800s, uh, a mechanical engineer as such wouldn't have even existed. It, would, it was such a, a brand new uh, technology. Anyway, uh, I got my line shaft up. I had to put that up before I put the lathe in here. And uh, I got these hangers. They're not the hangers that I would choose. They're 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 not self-oiling. You have to. They're essentially a loss lossy system, which you you put the oil on the bearings and it spins and probably good for you know three or four hours. And you got to monkey up there and oil them again. But I got them in there. And these right here uh, came with these little, uh, they catch the oil. One thing uh, you get in a line shaft uh, machine shop or, or blacksmith shop or any place that has a line shaft is drips of oil coming down. Now this one's right over the lathe. This one right here would be outside. And then uh, I got a couple more. Up here. I got four hangers up here. And But when you... Uh, uh, wander around in a machine shop you can have a tendency to get a drip of oil on you so they came up with these little oil catchers and this particular uh, style of hanger bearing really needs a, a oil catcher cup because this is a true lossy system it's got a little hole in the top it's a two piece bearing put a little oil in there and it's the spins good but uh, that oil has no place to be captured, and it'll it'll migrate out, and so those little uh, those little oil cups keep you from getting spots on your T-shirt. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to sh uh, show a couple things. The reason I wanted to show this is this is going away, and uh, once I cut it off and reposition it because it really should be where it belongs. It doesn't belong here. We'll, uh, I never see it again, so this is like a documentation. Anyway, I just wanted to share my beautiful old lathe with you guys. Uh, I'm don't really, I'm learning about, I'm a, I'm a student of history, and you know, being a student of history is one thing, reading books and watching videos, but it's really cool to have this stuff and and, uh, and this one I'm not going to do a restoration on it it's I think it's uh, too uh, valuable of a piece of history it's going to stay the way it is I mean I'll clean it up the I'm sure this paint isn't original uh, somebody painted it green but it's possibly that it was green uh, before they they painted it and they just painted it green again and you know all these pieces are all cast iron uh, which this uh, these legs back here and the the dog leg support the whole thing is all cast iron uh, I'm not sure when uh, mild steel was invented I think it was probably invented before this this lathe was was manufactured, but uh, I don't think the Siemens and the, and some of the blast furnace had been invented yet, and and so uh, steel uh, or mild steel wasn't really available, uh, except uh, you know it's very expensive. Like like in this case, they would they would have uh, cutting tools, which of course this one isn't uh isn't original i don't know if i got some let me see 
I'm still working to organize. These are just holders. But these little, the tool holders and the little pieces of tools, which I believe back in the day before uh, tool steel had been invented, uh, they, they would uh, add wolf's from to uh, iron and get a really hard uh, cutting tool, it would be harder than, than the material cutting, but I, I believe wolf's from uh, was uh, discovered in Germany and, and today we know it as tungsten. So they did have it, and, uh, but it was very expensive and I don't think it was until the very late 1800s before uh, actual uh, uh, cutting uh, tool steels were actually invented. And, and when tool steels were invented, that was another thing that would make this, this particular lathe obsolete because it's got plain bearings, the Babbitt bearings here, and uh, they would have been rated, you know, maxed out balls to the wall would have been like 500 RPMs. You'd never run one of these, and then you probably didn't even, you'd never run it that fast really, but that would be the top end. So these were made for slow speed, light cuts. You could do the same things with them. I believe they, uh, James Brown invented this rise and fall. It's hinged right there. I'm trying to, there it is, there's the hinge, I'm sorry. It's hinged there so that you, you can control it there. And what that was for was uh, when you bring the actual cutting tool up to your piece to cut, you could fine tune where that little point was meeting so you could, you could catch it right in the um, a sweet spot. When, you, when you're turning a piece of metal. And, and a lot of the reason for that was that tool steel did not exist. And a lot of your cutting tools, it's possible they could have been uh, case hardened and, and uh, just a little bit harder than what you were cutting. So uh, these people were smart and they, they, uh, they figured stuff out. And uh, I'm gonna let it go at that. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you later. Bye.